So Thomas, you are CTO. You are our real tech guy in the group, right?、Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I、uh, guess. And <laughs> I can't, hi, we're, I can't we're fix live, your router though. <laughs> we're, we're live right now.、Uh, my name is Gary Barker. I want to thank you and welcome you to what I think will be a fascinating conversation on reaching for the future with technology. Uh, I'm the director of sustainability for NextGen Packaging. I was previously founder and CEO of Ditto Sustainable Brand Solution, which is a green product design and manufacturing company. And I'll be moderating what I think is an incredible panel today.、Uh, some of the、uh, subjects that we'll be covering are sustainable investing, suggesting aiding the poor, nurturing water supplies, raising food. Uh, availability and better educating everyone. How do we use investments? How do we use technology to increase that?、Uh, businesses may have different priorities by leveraging technology. What are those priorities? How might the full spectrum of technology benefit the larger public?、Uh, what are the plausible futures of technology and investment? And finally, who will drive beneficial tech? So I'm very pleased to introduce my illustrious panel of experts here. After each,、uh, after the introductions, I'll allow each panelist to give short thoughts on the panel subject.、Uh, first up is Nicole Jian Li.、Uh, she is an executive partner of Plus One Capital in Shenzhen and chief investment officer at Anbo Investment in Atlanta, Georgia. Focused on real estate investment and construction. Ambo Investment works to build their clients' wealth by exceeding client expectations through innovative, intuitive, and conservative mindsets. Nicole holds a PRC lawyer certificate and received her Master Law of Degree in Emory University.、Uh, also with us is Andrew Natchison. Andrew is a media, tech, arts, civic, and social venture founder, a funder, advisor, executive, and creative analyst. A lot of commas there, Andrew. Uh, Andrew co-founded the Institute for the Connected Society and We the Media conferences and global innovation a, a、uh, global innovation community.、Uh, Andrew is currently chief communications and marketing advisor at、uh, officer at the National Communication Reinvestment Coalition, a, a U.S. nonprofit.、Um, we have David Hamilton who just joined us. He's a renowned global investor in a vision. Addition to industrial and real estate holdings, he has a portfolio of startups focused on impact, ranging across North America, Europe, Oceania, Asia, and Africa. For his work, he has been featured in media, including Entrepreneur, the J- Jerusalem Post, and Yahoo Finance, and named a fellow of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of the Arts, Manufactures, and Commerce.、Uh, let's see who else we have here. Thomas Thurston is a partner and chief technology officer of W R Hambrick Ventures. For more than 50 years, W R Hambrick has provided billions of dollars in early growth capital to more than 500 companies, including Apple, Amazon, Google, Adobe, Genentech, Pixar, Salesforce, and Intel. So I wanted to start out. We have、uh, two more、uh, panelists who may join us, and I'll introduce them then. Um, Nicole, would you like to just give、uh, three or so minutes、um, discussion about our subject and how we leverage technology and、uh, investment to make the world a better place? Uh, sure. Uh, to be honest, I'm not an expert in the technology sector,、uh, but as an investor, I would love to learn more and keep up with the latest trend.、Um, the future of technology is always very difficult to predict、uh, with the technology approach. One thing could just come out and completely change our lifestyle. It could be just anything. Um, certain trends worth mentioning, like the increasing、uh, demand for data in almost every area in our life. As we're generating more data, we will probably need more better ways to store and manage, and also analyze the data. And this will drive more innovation in area, areas such as、uh, big data and data privacy.、Um, I was in the other. 
panel uh, in the morning, and uh, they were talking about uh, the emergence of a quantum computer, and um, also the fast development of AI. Um, and both of these technologies, uh, to me, are more like a double-edged sword. Depends mm-hmm. who really can drive this technology behind. Um, so, which also will lead to a security problem. I mean, uh, whoever gets to have the quantum computer first is likely is like to have a like a nuclear weapon and other countries in the world will be just like more vulnerable to cyber attacks and um, other things. But on, on the other hand, it will also, the technology will also benefit um, larger public in a lot of ways. Uh, like I myself actually use the open AI from Elon Musk today to mm-hmm. propel our panel. Um, so who gets to, uh, about who gets to drive these uh, technologies in the future? To me, uh, it's still more likely to be like a combination of government large companies and startups with fundings behind and maybe even with part of ai uh, at least i myself will hope so <laughs> that might be actually more beneficial to the larger public uh, in a lot of ways uh, government and large companies have the resources to invest and in develop new technologies and they also have the public base to justify the investment. And startups with funding, they, more be, they will be more flexible and also innovative. They can probably have the new technologies more quickly. Uh, anyways, it's, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to be here today and learn more about what is really trendy from the real experts and uh, what might be just uh, speculative and conceptual from your perspective. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Great. And it's, it's going to be interesting to see who owns the data, who in, owns the technology and, and how that controls the situation, uh, which brings us to Andrew, who is our media uh, expert. And uh, you, you have some thoughts on, on the subject about, um, you know, the future of technology and, and investing. Sure. Um, well, lo- lots of thoughts. I won't, uh, be able to get to most of them. Here are a few kind of quick ones. First of all, you know, our subject matter technology, you, you know, even you can see from this panel what what a sweeping term that is. Everything is technology today. I mean, even, you know, yoga and exercise and meditation are technology today. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, this conversation could go anywhere. Um, you know, certainly uh, for me, uh, I'm, I'm interested in information uh, and uh, how people are informed, how people are connected. Uh, and, you know, we've seen the emergence of the web. Uh, we've seen the transition from what was at one point kind of a, a utopian hope that, you know, the web would set us free and enlighten us and, um, you know, spawn uh, freedom and democracy everywhere and enlightenment to uh, what we've wound up with, which is, um, you know, chaos, disinformation, um, uh, institutional control, uh, and, 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 and a trend exactly in the opposite direction toward um, censorship, less democracy, and, and autocracy. Right. Uh, so the two-edged sword, you know, in some, we've already lived the, through parts of that two-edged sword. Uh, And the hope for the future, uh, from my standpoint, uh, is that we're able to navigate that um, and in some some ways course correct uh, uh, to to ensure that, um, you know, freedom and, um, uh, and by by the way, when I say freedom, I don't mean only political freedom, but Mm -hmm. also just, um, you know, freedom of discourse, uh, uh, freedom, freedom in the sense of being able to access reliable, trusted information. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my hope is that we're able to um, uh, uh, in- innovate our ways out of where we are now. Uh, and of course, the great risk is that we don't. Right. Uh, and that technology turns out not even to be a two-edged sword, but to be uh, a one-edged sword that is more damaging uh, than helpful. Um, but there's, you know, there's still, there's, there's still utopian potential, uh, to, uh, to organize this chaos, um, and, and produce a better outcome. Um, and, and on that front, I would say, 
uh, access and control are, mm. are, are critical issues, uh, which are addressed, you know, both through technology and private sector innovation, but also through policy. Um, and, and in many ways, uh, the struggles we're dealing with are because policy uh, is behind the private sector. Yeah, great, uh, very insightful. And, and yeah, I mean, it's with with the internet and new technology. It's it's like when TV was invented, when radio was invented. All these different technologies brought on all these different changes in legal. Um, you know, situations. And um, I think that we're, we're going through that now, but this is such a huge issue. Uh, I see Rohan, you have uh, joined us. Um, Hi, man. Let me Can introduce you. Me? you. Uh, Rohan is co-founder of Icon Marine Time Technology Group. Uh, Rohan is a shipbuilder, a ship broker, ship broker. Uh, char- chartering, chartering a consultant and entrepreneur focusing on international shipping and chartering activities. Uh, later, lately, Rohan has moved to a small town in the hills of South India. Uh, congratulations. Uh, working on chemical and mechanical disruptive and eco-friendly tech projects, one of which is to disrupt our archaic shipping industry. And um, Rohan, I'll, I'll get right back to you, but I wanted to get to uh, David. Uh, David, and get your thoughts on, on the panel um, subject. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, we live in an age that has some of the greatest potential and the greatest peril uh, ever in history. And uh, technology is behind that. Uh, we, what we are experiencing now is no different you know, on a fundamental level than uh, what has you know, happened in the past, except it has accelerated. That two-edged sword that has already been alluded to is, uh, has that much more power. That sword is now not just a gun, but a nuclear weapon a, a, in, in magnitude. So with that, uh, with that potential and that peril, we have a choice. Uh, Andrew alluded to a moment ago uh, about uh, even yoga and meditation have been technologized. Well, that is where that conscious choice and what we do with that, that uh, two-edged sword, that implement is what is going to determine where this goes. Because things are so accelerated, uh, a, we're in a very critical time. I would say this decade is pivotal uh, and uh, that uh, we're going to see a, a potentially a fair amount of destabilization, but also potentially a fair amount of uh, rebuilding and new f- forms in society. So what do we do with that? How do we handle that? And that's why it's important that we use probably the oldest you know, technology, you know, or the source of all that technology, use our good brains, our common sense and our human decency to, uh, to use these technologies for the better. Because it's imperative that we educate you know, more of the population. There's a lot of, even in developed uh, nations, there's a, that we haven't reached our full potential for education, but mm-hmm. developing nations uh, have, uh, there are so many that aren't, and we're going to need to come up with new ma- ways of getting that education because those who are educated can make better choices and they can get better their lives and be in a position to make different choices and also become the innovators that can uh, hopefully uh, shepherd this uh, decade into a better uh, world uh, for our uh, children and our children's children. I mean, we are not out of the woods. Mm-hmm. It could go either way. And uh, that utopia, it, it, we ought to remember that that is from a Greek term for no place. So right. we can strive toward that and have that goal, but also realize that there are there is the complete opposite possibility and and that there are people who are going to make other choices with that technology. So it's uh, so I, I would say I have a cautious optimism as to about where some of this can head, depending on the choices that we make. And, and it's again, it's no different than history. It's just accelerated those trends by virtue of technology being that much more powerful. Yeah, interesting. Uh, some great, great points there. I love the greatest potential and the greatest peril. It's, it's so very true. Um, Thomas, um, can you talk about your um, work and in investment and how, how that, um, what your experience in that is with uh, investing for the future and for sustainable good? 
um, so, so as a venture capitalist, right, there's this question, how can technology help us solve problems like sustainability and poverty? Um, and, and then at some level, that's pretty straightforward, but I, I, I do wrestle openly, and I think maybe we can do that together today with some of these, these challenges, because sometimes there's a dichotomy that's harder to resolve, because at the end of the day, we have to put money on a bet, so we, mm -hmm. we have to take action. <laughs> and for example, um, you know, sustainability and poverty aren't always necessarily on the same page. So what right. do you do when there's a conflict? For example, let's say you find a great company, they make an $80,000 electric vehicle. So is that is that helping sustainability or poverty is the question. Right. Now, oh, it's electric. Of course it was. Well, no, actually it could be that the carbon footprint is actually equal to that of a standard car over the seven to 10, first seven to 10 years before you start to get a payback from the electric side of things. So, and most people are gonna change cars every few years, right? I mean, so, right. Um, so is that a sustainable investment or not? Or are we just kind of kidding ourselves? Um, mm -hmm. Does it help poverty? Well, I don't know how much a $70,000 car is really gonna help people living on a dollar a week, right? So, right. so these are the real kind of rubber meets the road problems when you're looking at a specific deal and it's very case by case. And, and I don't think I, I think we're all trying to do our best, but I, I, I can't say that I, I know every time what the right thing is to do and whether what this investment that might have the best intentions in the world is contributing one way or another. Right. And I don't have the time to become a PhD and study every issue for 12 years to get to the bottom of it. So, so a lot of it is us trying to do what we can uh, to help these issues. But I think there's genuine live issues at stake here. And, and sometimes, while well, good intentions don't actually reach the target. So, so those are really tough. And I also think that um, there is a relationship between poverty and sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm not sure, you know, there's kind of a mixture of cause and effect there. Uh, but, you know, when, when there's poverty, a lot of people are worried about feeding themselves. They're about surviving, about shelter. Um, you know, I live in Panama. You just have to drive by the, the coast and all you see is a pile of trash, like the whole way. Why? It's because people are in poverty. They can't think about sustainability. Um, so can you do things that help both? Can you help invest in, in innovations and technologies to help lift people out of poverty, whether it's clean water or education or access to commerce or whatever the case may be? And can you, can you draw some kind of dotted line from that uh, to actually something that, that helps everyone be more sustainable just by lowering the poverty rate. Um, I also think that a lot of times people at the low end of the poverty spectrum, given the right tools, actually become the best stewards of the environment if, if you let them, because they don't want to live in squalor either. Right? They right. have much more incentive. But those are very different kind of innovations, right? That's not a new app to help you, you know, to pass some time while you're waiting in line. And, uh, you know, I mean, that that's... Um, so, so really having to try to think about these causal relationships, wrestle with them, knowing we don't actually know how it all works and, and trying to figure out where do I actually put money on the actual companies to try to make some headway. And I, I think it's genuinely difficult. And this is, this is the kind of thing that I'm always wondering and second guessing. Yeah, and it's it's um, how effective is it? I mean, um, my involvement with sustainability as far as design and manufacturing, you're constantly weighing uh, two different things and you're trying to figure out what's the most effective um, uh, decision between those two things. And the same thing with investing is that how much can you really affect the situation or, or affect the way an industry is moving towards. So that's something I want to get into a little later on. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, Rohan, with your um, experience in shipping logistics, Chartering, I'm very interested in your work um, in investment and sustainability and how technology has, has changed that. Well, um, I, um, so I've been, a, I've been an entrepreneur almost all of my life. And uh, when, I used, when I had a regular job, I uh, tended to own my tasks and stuff like that. So one of the, and I started very early in my peer group, uh, as an example, was at least 15 years older than I was. A uh, peer group in terms of status or position or power. And I had no other way to compete <clears throat> other than to use tech uh, or use what was available and what was not being used or what was just being used or being experiment, uh, experimented on. And I, I, I firmly believe that technology used well 
can solve not all obviously it can't solve all our problems can can make a huge difference uh, i'm uh, i'm a crisis manager so i'm very blunt i i i don't have time for sound bites just for the sake of a sound bite mm-hmm. you know whatever solution is presented needs to be tried needs to be experimented uh, with and it needs to work so uh, saying good stuff just for the you know uh, you know for pr uh, that i i i'm not from that that world uh and uh, uh i i i obviously share thomas's uh, point of view uh, on on the poor and uh, you know uh, raising folks up you know today uh, we have a materialistic society we have uh, technology that is creating problems also in that there's information everywhere of all sorts and if you look at india where i am you know we have one of the fastest growing a uh, smartphone uh, uh, and smart device uh, you know uh, ownership in the world so knowledge is going on very very fast and these folks they have aspirations they want to grow and like you said thomas you know they want to get out of this squalor so uh i i i believe that um we can get there but it will not uh you know the carrot and stick approach for example there's a lot of talk today about the developing world not doing enough and so on and so forth but you know with for folks like this you can't use a carrot and stick it, it has to be only the carrot what stick <laughs> they are getting the stick already before you offer them the carrot so right. um right. so you you need to you know get them out and that's where education helps and that's where obviously uh technology will 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 help education you know the so called covid thing for me and so many of us who do a lot of volunteer work actually was a blessing because we finally had everybody uh, at par effectively from folks who are billionaires to folks who have nothing actually getting uh, education delivered to their doorstep on a device and many governments all over the world actually tried yes there were a lot of uh, folks who did not have uh, the facilities but they tried and uh, this is a sign that you know the status quo actually is not necessarily what uh, you know is uh, is is not necessarily the solution and change Uh, of course is 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 inevitable but uh in my industry for example i'm a very old industry you know i talked about archaic shipping right it's a 4000 year old business a lot of the common law systems uh, that you guys uh you know live with actually came from the shipping industry people don't change i don't know why i mean i have my own anecdotal uh, answers that you know in shipping people don't uh, retire they just go on and on and on and on until they die and the old man still runs the company and he has not changed he doesn't care right so but if you all across our industry we 2.5% of the carbon footprint right globally yeah. so about 800 900 million uh, tons of co2 okay on an annual basis and we are reducing it every year by let's say 3 or 4% everybody all the young folks that i know of today all my trainees all my mentees everyone's working on some startup or the other or some way to change to add yeah. value to our industry Mm-hmm. and 90% of global trade is by sea 90% mm-hmm. so and, and with the supply chain so um yes. fractured now it's um you can see why it's a need i mean uh, the the fracturing of the supply chain i think there's a lot more than meets the eye okay mm-hmm. uh my, my i mean i'm li- i'm living on a mountain right now and i was just i was at a dinner just now before i came here and said how much money do you make in shipping mate i said uh not much actually but my friends have made more money in one year than they have made in the last 20 years right so so you know there's, there's a lot more like, there's a lot more to the story but unfortunately the consumer yeah i mean i'm talking about the, the normal consumer not someone who has specific daily needs he or she is actually fueling this demand right uh and uh and and, and, and every, how su- how successful yeah. is it if if the consumer you know the the companies that hire shippers uh, you know because we we have the same issue where um shipments are 2 months behind and the price is going through the the ceiling the so as a as a okay. shipper it's good because you're charged more but as a as a consumer it's 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 a serious issue uh so that's what you think right so my costs are going up as well my costs have gone up significantly yeah. so uh, i i i i got someone to call me he said i want to ship i want to contain it for example right he would have paid 6000 dollars a day um a couple of years back right. today he needs to pay 22000 dollars a day just for the ship forget about the costs right. so so uh, 
you just uh, you, you uh, just do your own do your own math yeah. um and uh, you have a lot of other uh, other other unrelated uh, causes actually that's contributing to this I you know, we have politics. We have, uh, um, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, we have war oh, these days, and, and more. So, uh, but from a from a retail individual's point of view, you know, it's very simplistic. It's what the the the, the broadsheet tells you, and you believe that uh, as the word. It's I think I because I mean I know there's a lot more to all this than actually. Um, I, I can uh, yeah yeah that. yeah. Okay, I, I'd love to, to to open this up a little bit more yeah. to everybody and. Uh, one of the things I'm I'm curious about, and I think is is part of the subject of this panel, is how effective is uh, investing to move the needle as far as um, changing the way businesses work. As far as um, uh, are, are you seeing a change in businesses due to investment preferences for startups, for uh, for you know, clients, um, retirement fund, that sort of thing. How do you, how do you see, is it affecting it and is it moving things? And I'll just open it up to everyone. Don't be, don't be shy. I'll start off. Uh, I would say there has been uh, a shift in part because of there's been enough media attention and enough, uh, you know, consumer demand for more sustainable products, more for sustainable technologies. So from that end, I think is where some of it started. And then you see when you're in conference rooms at investment conferences, ESG over the last, you know, some odd years has become more and more from what originally a very niche not paid attention to conference topic to being one of the considered one of like more important panels, uh, for example. So you have seen that progression. It was driven some as well because there have been more and more different kinds of you know, technologies come out, but there is more interest. And as there's more opportunities to invest in that, there's also more money flowing toward this. So I'd say it's a little bit of both and and beyond that both and. Right. And, and Thomas, are you seeing it being effect, effective, are you, are you looking at investing in more sustainable um, uh, investments? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, in some ways, I think this year's circular economy is, um, it's this year's blockchain, right? So, you know, every, every couple of years we get a new theme, there was AI and blockchain, and we can go all the way back to RFID, 50, I mean, Right. And, and this year it's circular economy, which, which I think is a good thing, by the way. But um, you don't the, think it's the, a it's permanent never... thing. Well, hopefully. Yeah, I think circular economy is a, a permanent effort. And, and but right now it's kind of taken, I think, one of the top one or two seats in terms mm-hmm. of in the venture capital community, what's hot right now. Um, and, and that's OK if it means that a lot of t- money is going to flow to solutions that really have a great benefit. So that, that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I'm already, I can already tell you, I mean, it, I've never heard it this loud and this at the forefront of minds. And this is what it used to just be something nobody cared about. And then it was something people talked about and it was just lip service. And that was for a few decades. But now it, it's legitimate and it's in boardrooms and it, it really is something companies are, want to do. Um, and they're, they're being held accountable for, for the life cycle of their products as well, right? And so things like carbon yeah. capture, things like bioplastics, all of this stuff is really become gone from the fringe to the, the mainstream. And now it's in center stage. Right. And, and Nicole, as far as your experience in China, too, are you seeing it affecting manufacturers or, or I, certainly it is the government, but, you know, in what other areas are you seeing it? I'll just unmute myself. Yeah, um, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about related to what Thomas just said about poverty in China. And uh, we just have the, like, uh, the minister of China just came out with the data, like uh, 0.6 billion people in China actually living with just 200, less than 200 uh, monthly salary. Um, so with that, a big, like, amount of people living in poverty, what is really sustainable for like uh, investment in China? Like we invested in one of the uh, platform uh, in China and that actually making money from all those uh, relatively poor people. And uh, it, it came out with very successful. And 
I don't know if you heard of it, it's called Pinduoduo. Mm -hmm. And they're actually just trying to make people group and shopping and lower their uh, individual price. And it's making making money from the poor mm -hmm. group. And that is also can be financially rewardable and maybe can be helpful to the people who live in poverty. Mm -hmm. And also with all the you know all the COVID restrictions in Shanghai in anywhere in China right now, I'm not gonna lie. And now might now be very like might be a tricky time. Uh, right. I'll put it that way. If you want to enter into the Chinese market. However, compared to other uh, sectors, I feel like the new energy and re renewable energy um, uh, might be worth mentioning to answer uh, the question about investment in China. And because mm -hmm. China's uh, capital emissions have been tripled in the past three decades, mm -hmm. and uh, the government has voted to reach net zero emission by the year of uh, 2060. Um, and that is a very tough uh, target for us. Uh, in recent years, the Chinese government also has invested heavily in like new energy cars as a way out. And uh, China has actually become the world's uh, largest market for uh, new energy cars in mm -hmm. the year of 2020. Um, so everyone knows the environment in China can never be really successful if we are not study the policy <laughs> which mm -hmm. the government really emphasizes on. Uh, so the reason why uh, we, the, we are so obsessed with the uh, uh, new energy cars is not only about the environmental concerns, it's also because China heavily relied on imported oil. Mm -hmm. And that's why like, we are more looking forward to the new energy cars to help to reduce the dependence. And also um, with the large population in China and also the limited resource, uh, I feel like another sustainable investment area um, my worst look into will be the technology using in agriculture. Mm -hmm. Because um, mm -hmm. the policy yeah. um, won't go against with food and people need to survive. And there are many opportunities that arise also uh, for the sustainable agriculture practice that can probably help to increase the production while also preserving the environment. Right. And, yeah. and is a lot of this government driven? Um, I, I think for the uh, carbon emission part, it's mostly just mm -hmm. government driven. But uh, I feel like uh, a lot of uh, like uh, uh, even investors and entrepreneurs in China are aware of the situation about uh, the environment. And yeah, but, but it's mostly, but we can do nothing without the government driving in China. <laughs> of, of course. But uh, well, that's that's encouraging that the private sector is, is moving it as right. well. Um, yeah. Andrew, um, over your, your career, you've written a lot about social impacts and values. And um, what do you see about the future of technology and, and whether it can make a better place as far as, you know, the business world or, you know, in, in any sector at this point? Yeah, well, um Look, I'm you know I'm still hopeful for technology uh, as as a force for good, uh, n n no question. Um, you know, but to your to your previous point about investing, um, you know I I see uh, in, investing, including uh, ESG investing, impact investing, social investing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, you know, I still see the universe of investing as a market driven uh, yeah. uh, uh, business, not not uh, an ethically or humanitarian business. Uh, and, and that's where the role of policy and government comes in, um, uh, you know, which we see in, you know, in, in energy and, uh, and and climate driven uh, investing. Uh, it's not because it's not because people with capital have suddenly decided they need to save the planet. Uh, it's because there are market opportunities uh, that, that make it worthwhile for them to do that. Um, and and, you know, some would argue that that's, a, you know, that's a feature uh, of, of capitalism, um, uh, you know, or alternatively, you know, it's also a fatal flaw. Um, when, when, when policy is, is not uh, driving the kinds of investments that we need to lift people out of poverty, uh, to address climate change, 
uh, to ensure that, um, you know, the, the planet, it functions in a sustainable way. So, we're, so, so the future of technology, um, I think that is really dependent uh, uh, on policy choices uh, and, um, uh, and, and behavior, which is also influenced by policy choices. Um, you know, are, are we a free society? Are we a well-informed society? Are we uh, crippled by disinformation and political discord um, be, because we, we, we can't manage our information experience in a sustainable way? And by the way, sustainability uh, in media and information systems um, is, is mostly a term used to um, explain survival uh, <laughs> rather, rather yeah. than uh, sustaining the planet. In, in fact, I think it's notable that uh, information businesses mostly don't address climate and sustainability the way most of the business sector does. Uh, I mean, most other business sectors. Um, uh, you know, the newspaper business for years um, was silent on, uh, on the environmental impact of cutting down forests to print newspapers. And it still mostly is. Um, only that business has has cratered, uh, so so uh, they're cutting down fewer forests. Um, and that was the technology of you know printed newspapers, you know, being the main form of information. Absolutely, so. um, <laughs> and, and and just as that business was being disrupted by technology uh, because of the internet and the web, um, it also was silent on uh, you know what could have been. Uh, you know, a positive narrative around, um, you know, ending the, uh, the deforestation uh, mm -hmm. that traditional media uh, cause uh, and, and shifting to potentially more sustainable digital uh, experiences, right. you know, with the asterisk uh, that there's a tremendous carbon <laughs> footprint there too. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a really good point that I'd like to address everyone is that it isn't that the, the information that we're giving, uh, whether it's for investing, whether it's um, marketing, whether it's um, the businesses are getting it, whether it's coming from consumers or coming from investors, isn't the information uh, portals um, critical to this? Uh well, I'll just, I, I don't want to dominate this, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, what we know, how we know it, and what we're able to do with trusted, reliable information, um, you know, is, 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 is central to the future. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, even if you want to think of that simplistically uh, in the narrative around climate change and how, and how long it took for the planet to come to terms uh, with with a change in climate, uh, and yeah. and and that struggle was really a struggle over information and knowledge, right? And trust, yeah, and trust, which has been a theme throughout this entire conference. Uh, I I think it's really interesting, um, Rohan, with your experience in in logistics as far as getting information is concerned and what the competition is doing, how do you see it affecting uh, your industry? You're, you're on mute. Our, our industry has been significantly uh, uh, um, disrupted uh, from, on the commercial side, not on the operational side. So on the commercial in that information is flowing fast, uh, a lot of our technologies came from the banking system because basically ship broking and my, uh, you know, it's, it's a financial service. Uh, what is shipping? It's a derived demand. If you guys don't need something, we don't need us. So uh, right. unless there is international trade, uh, there is, uh, you know, you need international trade to, to, to have shipping. So on one hand, on the commercial side, information has actually, uh, we have a huge amount of AI, we have a huge amount of processes in place to actually trust and, ver and verify a lot of in 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 inbound information. But that's at the professional B2B2B level. Okay. At consumer level, not necessarily so. 
because there's a lot of stuff out there. There are a lot of folks who are uh, finding solutions uh, that are people friendly on the retail side, the last mile systems and so on and so forth. But in between, no. It, it, it exists. Like I said earlier, there's a huge amount of technology uh, across various uh, uh, you know, fields uh, you know, uh, being uh, tested and, in fact, being deployed. That is having um, a huge amount of impact uh, on the industry, but this is not yet in the public domain. A lot of it is not yet. So um, it's, a mix, it's a mix of both. It's a mix of both. And what, what are we getting? Obviously, we are a regulated industry in many ways. We, we, we also have a lot of self-regulation. Uh, it's very diluted industry. It's all over the world. Uh, the good thing is, because we are regulated, we have very few regulations that are applying to various geographies. So actually, a lot of people are benefiting out of it. But if you have a, a, a sovereign state, for example, that is anti-shipping, and you have a lot of these uh, 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 countries all over the world, then no matter how good we are, we still fall into a trap once we, uh, because, you know, I need to take my ship from A to B. And my customer pays me to get to B. But if the country B actually is against my industry, then I have a problem. And then there's a fallback. So it's, it, it's quite complicated. But uh, a lot of people, like I said, are doing things. We are yet, we, I don't think our industry is educating the public on the positive effect they're actually having. Yeah. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, it's not enough is not being done. Well, I, I mean, been, how, many been, ships do you, how many ships do you know that sink you you don't right. know right right but if an aircraft uh, you have one small accident a tire burst the whole world the media picks it up and it's all over the world so not, not many people know about our industry and i i hope that uh, you know our guys can actually spread the word on the good stuff that they are trying to do yeah and i and i have have studied supply chain and logistics and how technology is revolutionizing that and um it's it's you know, being able to quickly define ships uh, where there's, um, you know, a, a rise in activity and, um, you know, move containers around and, and deal with that. So it's, um, I, I, I see technology as being huge as far as what you're, what you're dealing with. So, so you, you, you see, you use the word container, right? Which is a, fra- which is a small fraction of my industry. Really? Most huh? of the world's trade is in bulk. And it's and who consumes this? It's ask the question: Who is buying and who is paying? Follow the money, right? And you you will be surprised at what goes from where to where. Mm-hmm. No politics. It's it's quite interesting. I sign bills of lading, so I know who's buying what, right? right? And it's on my signature that people actually cash uh, their and cash their documents. So we just look with a smirk and say, "Say la we." So there's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite it's quite, it's quite it's quite it's quite interesting. Yes. Yeah, I mean that's that's fascinating. David, what do you how do how do you deal with information and technology with your investment and and how how do you how do you find trust in your information? Well, uh, in some ways, I'm actually old school. I, I I if I actually know somebody, it's a lot easier to do business with them than uh, than just you know somebody hits me cold through LinkedIn or. Or whatever, but you know, to answer the technology side of it uh, and information, uh, it, it's information important because if you take action based on information and that information is inaccurate, you uh, reap the consequences of that inaccuracy. So it's definitely important. Uh, I would say uh, I look for information. I will look at multiple sources. I'll also you know mm-hmm. tap experts that I know personally, you know, as the well. Trust issue. So uh, yeah. because they, it's like a, because they are trusted because they, they've delivered before. I know if, if I know them well and they're in my network, that that is you know, very helpful. But, you know, it, it, we are living in an age where a lot of the what we see and print it isn't always accurate. Right. Uh, and a lot of what we hear, uh, you know, see in a video it may not be accurate. So uh, coming at that with a healthy degree of skepticism, I find helpful and listening to multiple sources at the end of the day, making my own decision. Because whether because I'm going to be the one bearing the consequences if I invest in something based on inaccurate you know information that's just floating around out there. So right. 
that that comes down to something the old fashioned personal responsibility because whether we like it or not at the end of the day we're going to pair response and responsibility in it so i would say that that's you know how i go about that uh, in my decision making well and that brings up the point is would you recommend an investment that um that does improve the situation for the public good, but may not have as high of a return. And where, where do you have that balance between uh, the return versus um, socially good? Personally, as an as an impact investor, I come at it as an investor. I think you know there are th- because a lot of the problems that we're cr- that we're dealing with. Yeah, if we solve those problems, they are going to be profitable in a lot of instances mm-hmm. because they're massive problems. However, for certain things that may not be profitable, uh, I personally feel those fall more under things like government grants, uh, philanthropic foundations, or just general R and D. So there's, you know, there's, you know, multiple, you know, different ways of coming at this and funding these things. An investment by, you know, by its very definition does need to have potential for profit. But, you know, there because there is such a wide uh, field uh, of different investments and different problems being solved, uh, if you're looking to make an impact and uh, do well by doing that good. There, there is no dearth of opportunities for that because we have so many crises. There's oppor- multitudes of opportunities for that. Right, right. And and um, Thomas, this brings the point. I read an article recently that the pandemic encouraged uh, sustainable uh, disruption due primarily to market because a market disruption of the um, and, and uncertainty of the of the pandemic and um, a lot of investors are going towards more sustainable investments simply because of the increased resiliency. Um, do, you, do you feel that way with your investments that the pandemic has changed the focus and that sustainability equals resiliency? Oh, um, yeah, it's a loaded, loaded question. Yeah, well, well I, I, I don't know, uh, but I'll, I'll just maybe speak. Part of your question, I think there's a few pieces there. But um, so our main focus, not not 100 percent, but let's say 80 percent of our focus in the last three years has actually been in healthcare, uh, actually investing in diagnostics related businesses. Um, and that was before COVID. And then, of course, COVID happened. And we saw really a kind of a most of our businesses actually we, I mean, to be investing in healthcare diagnostics when a pandemic comes, you know, as you would imagine, is kind of right time, right place. Um, mm most of our investments just got greatly accelerated by the pandemic uh, in kind of a silver lining, but, but a few of them struggled. And, and anytime it was involved in actual, for example, doctor patient interaction, uh, physical interaction, you know, so, so it didn't affect all the businesses in a positive way. Um, I, but of course the other piece is that under, uh, you know, especially the very end, you know, sort of the last, the last half of 2021, that's when valuations just went crazy overnight. Um, Mm -hmm. And and it actually took that long before, even in healthcare diagnostics, we saw it. It felt like one day, a startup that would have been 20 million on any other year, (laughs) suddenly was 120 million overnight, and they were raising that money, Uh, not not necessarily from us. (laughs) So now that bubble's coming back down and there's a lot of down rounds happening. So, um, and who knows where, where it'll end, but probably somewhere higher than it otherwise would have, but not as high as the peak. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I do think though healthcare is, uh, I mean, I guess we could get into the philosophical nuances here, but, but I, I do think in large part, healthcare tends to be something that actually does impact human well-being in a positive way, right? I mean, it's, it's a, a, one, not the whole, but one piece of helping the poor, of sustainability. Um, doesn't make it perfect, and some innovations are better than others. But look, we're all patients, right? It's not right. the patient. It's us. And, and if we can really help healthcare become more accessible, more effective, lower cost, then that helps everybody. Um, so it is a nice place where you feel like, hey, at the minimum, I might be helping patients with these deals, right? <laughs> now, is the medical device using biodegradable plastic and is it filling up landfills? It too, it yeah. could, you know, it's like, okay, so now what do I do, right? Do I do it or not? Uh, I mean, right. these are, these are live dilemmas. Um, 
you know, well, I, I, to, to the earlier point, though, we invest to make money. That, I mean, that's we're investing other people's money, so we, we can't be too. I mean, that's our mandate. And that's what we said we're going to do. But I actually think it's um, if you find the future market leader, the real disruptor, and there's usually only a tiny number, um, you will accomplish both. So in other words, if you find something that's disrupting water desalination or any of these problems in ESG, if you find the market leader, you, you're going to make a ton of money. And that company is going to have a huge impact because it's successful, because it's growing, its products are actually, if you compromise and you say, oh, let's, you know, I don't know if we're going to make any money on this deal, but it seems like great technology, you actually end up with neither because the company probably won't go anywhere. So despite its technology, despite how cool, it just doesn't actually have an impact on the problem and you don't make money. So I think true north is to say, find me the market leaders in those areas that can help the world. If you do that, you will make money. If you mm -hmm. don't, nothing else mattered because you have a dead portfolio. Right? So. Yeah, it, interesting. And and it's something when I started my company, I started it back in 2006. And it took 15 years before the market uh, caught up to what I was <clears> doing. <throat> so, uh, you know, and then when it finally caught up, we, we were um, we were there. We were the, one of the early adapters. So that's the other thing is that, you know, investing too early um, in a technology. Um, how, how do the rest of you feel about that? Isn't this kind of a, a waiting game to see when something is, is going to become, um, you know, viable, uh, Nicole? Yeah, I guess that is a very good question. And that's what we were thinking uh, every day, like what is the next trend? And especially for investors, we think we, in, we, are, we are smart, but actually for technical people, we, uh, we are like, we don't understand anything about technology. Like for many of us, uh, we did invest in something like NT, NFT in many of us, but who knows what's going to be really like in the future and we we cannot really tell like what's gonna be viral and uh like related to what thomas said just now like health scale has been booming a lot for the last couple of years and we also be part of it and um it one thing is to like um, part of it is to making money of course because we are also investing somebody else's money and mm -hmm. we need to be profitable but other we do want to help people and the world to uh, survive this crisis. And um, it seems like um, for a lot of like technology in healthcare industry, uh, they seems quite like, a, uh, I don't know how to say like, oh, I, I don't understand how those really technology, like some, some of that, they really put some small machine into the uh, blood, blood, right? how they call it and uh, they were deducted if we have cancer or not a uh, cancer or not so uh, it's really since we cannot really understand in a very systematic way how this technology really works so that that is a huge problem for us especially for me I'm not really an investor in the technology se sector so that is even harder um, yeah <laughs> well, if, if, Andrew don't you need to be a futurist in order to uh, be thinking that way? I mean, doesn't that have to be your thing rather than, okay, I've got a, you know, trend is part of, of my client's portfolio, you know, looking forward, sustainability is part of my portfolio rather than being investors that that's their niche is sustainable investments. I mean, don't you have to be a, a crystal ball reader in order to 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 guess what's coming down the pike well it, look I, you know i think you know all investors you know uh uh want, want to do that um and business leaders say they want to as well uh, uh you know un understanding the future um is is kind of a strategic imperative and yet um you know there is mythology or myth making uh, in, in, in futurism as well. It's very, you know, it's very hard to predict human behavior and technology innovation does not dictate human behavior. Right, right. It's the other way around. Yeah, yeah David, what do you think? Well, I uh, do think that... Uh, state, state the question again. Well, do, <laughs> does... 
um, you know, how, how do we, if, if looking for trends is how we um, look forward to new innovations and um, does that, isn't that kind of a full-time job is studying the future and, and what, what's possible and, or is it just, that's just part of your portfolio? Well, not- I would say I, I do pay attention quite a bit to uh, different uh, trends and where I think things are heading because it, I mean, to reference something that earlier, like you mentioned uh, about how uh, you uh, were 15 years early. Well, it's better to be too early than too late. That it's is for sure. Yeah. Provided it depends on, on the timeline that you're out, that. Provided you can <laughs> afford to wait that time out. Yeah. If you are the early bird, you are going to get that worm at some point. Right. But if you're assuming you can wait that out. But, uh, but definitely it is much better to be timely and at the right time rather than too early uh, of course and now to watch those uh, trends yes i mean it's important to be paying attention to what's going on and i find that you know looking at history also helps uh, one see where things could potentially go as well and then bringing in the technologies and what is being talked about if you've noticed a lot of things uh, trends you know at first you know some fringe element it will be talking about it and nobody listens right. then you know it's starting talked about more and more so i mean that's another piece that comes into seeing where things are going yet you know, as well because it as those voices gain momentum there uh, that's you know helps uh, looking at trends but you know it's just being about being observant as well uh, of uh, being observant what's going around around one being observant as to you know the past and the present and the potential futures that that uh, that can come out of that note i say futures plural because we have a choice in that and uh, someone else uh, as it was i believe it was you andrew uh, that said uh, you know something about myth making and uh, and also a lot of uh, myth making uh, can also make some markets yep. uh, for better oh, yeah. or worse. So oh, be yeah. be conscious of what media uh, we uh, what we're putting out there into media. Be conscious of those voices because that can also turn things. So right. I would say it's a complicated, a simple question with a very complicated answer. But then again, life itself is is pretty complex. Yeah, uh, good point. Uh, we have three minutes left, so. Um, Maybe I can ask you all for just closing comments. Um, Thomas, any any last uh, words, observations? Just only that um, part of this idea of how can technology help us look at the future. Um, you know, our firms really embrace that, and I, I think that was part of what was interesting to me in this panel, where we we've spent tens of millions of dollars developing analytics in-house um, to help us understand what's going on in markets. Um, and and there's no crystal ball. But we are finding it does give us a lot of a lot of advantages, and it's only the beginning. And I, I think we are going to start to see the the venture capital world and private equity world get more and more into data as it becomes available. Um, and I think it's it'll never be 100% quant, nor should it yeah. be. Um, right. But we, it's, it's something we're definitely taking very very seriously, and uh, we have a whole team of in-house data scientists and programmers. So that's very unique in venture capital to have that kind of commitment. Uh, but we think it's it's become more and more imperative as there's more and more companies out there that are identical when cycles start. You know, you get this new thing and all of a sudden there's 50 startups that are almost identical and you know a couple of them are going to be huge, but you don't know which one. That's a right. very interesting problem. Right. Um, and so I, I think we're, we're trying to lean into it and, and really be part of it as opposed to try to be traditional venture capitalists and hope it doesn't affect us. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ron, what do you, any last comments? Uh, well, uh, you know, the trend is your friend, but don't follow the sheep. I mean, that's my policy, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> and, um, well, uh, what, what we've been trying to do is uh, uh, look at, uh, uh, not, not get too reactionary, come up with something where you're the leader, you know, you're, you have the first mover advantage, but we are balancing that. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to wait for 15 years. But, uh, you know, uh, no one wants to wait for 15 years, right? We want money tomorrow. But, but I'm, I'm balancing that by, uh, by partnering and tying up with folks who, with, who have developed patented technologies and um, 
you know, uh, so so we are, we, we, we are, that, that's how we are, uh, you know, balancing our portfolio, where we invest and where, where we are active. So there's a lot of stuff we are doing, R&D, to tackle, uh, you know, you, I think Thomas, you talked about carbon capture. We're, we're doing all sorts of stuff, magnetic filtration, clean technologies, human, uh, you know, focused stuff. But we are also transposing uh, tech and solutions that are working in certain other segments of the industry that are not very not in the public eye, and we're introducing them uh, to us. So we are, we are, you know, we are, we are, we are mixing. I think one needs to have an open mind, uh, be very, very apolitical about it, and we're all in, on this to make money. At the, but at the end of the day, irrespective of how you do it, I think it will all add up. I think the net, it will be net positive, and it, uh, you know, the, the planet and the people, people will benefit. I'm a very, you know, positive uh, person, so I have, I have faith. That's right. all I have to say. Great. Well, that's that's an important part of investing, isn't it? <laughs> Faith. <laughs> uh, David. Yeah. Well, I will uh, conclude uh, by saying that, yes, we have that potential for that faith that uh, Rohan mentioned to be realized and to have a better world. But we also need to pay attention that there are a lot of people who are uh, who uh, are are still sheep. You know, and, yeah. <laughs> are not, uh, and are not necessarily aware of what's going on. And uh, there are people who are shepherds who are shepherding those sheep sometimes in not good directions. Yeah. And so because with technology being as powerful as it is and with multiple technologies coming together, you know, and accelerating all at the same time, we are in a make or break decade. And yeah. that yeah. Uh, so what we need to do is uh, is really become educated. Uh, I mean, for the general populace, that's important. Uh, those who are need, need to you know make you know, good decisions, invest in companies that will further human liberty, further sustainability, further uh, you know uh, discourse rather than discord. Uh, so those are important you know decisions that people in our position can make. But uh, but uh, we alone are not the only you know ones in this. There's people that uh, that uh, I mentioned developing nations earlier. There, uh, I think a lot of solutions that are going to solve their problems are more likely to come out of their societies when there's further education, so that they can be those change makers there that come up with those solutions. Because nobody knows their market and their problems like they do. Yep. So it, it comes yep. down to a lot of education, but also not just knowledge, but wisdom and, you know, applying those technologies for, uh, you know, the benefit of the greater good and investing in those technologies that do have that come up with those solutions. Those are going to be the greatest money makers of the 21st century yep. because we'll have solved the problems that yeah. were caused in the 20th right. century. Right. Yeah, well said. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, look, very briefly, I'll just, you know, technology can be an equalizer. Um, uh, and, and we've seen many examples of where it really has been. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's also um, uh, divisive and, um, and can be, um, you know, used for male malevolent purposes mm -hmm. uh, as well as humanitarian purposes. Uh, and, and lastly, um, even even where technology is, in theory, an equalizer, uh, it may not be unless there is equal access. Right. Great. Uh, well said. Thank you. Nicole. Uh, yeah, I just want to add very quickly, like with exporting technology, uh, we should still be like uh, keep in mind about where the limits are and where mm -hmm. the social and legal and policy limits are. And that is also matters how quickly uh, the real technology can be incorporated into business and into uh, how these technologies can gain the real benefits to the larger mm -hmm. public and the world. Yeah. Great. Yeah, especially Great. coming from China. Yeah. Well put. Well, this was a fascinating panel. Um, Nicole Jayan Lee, uh, Andrew Natchison, David Hamilton Nichols, uh, Rohan Shetty, and Thomas Thurston. Thank you very much. I learned a lot from this, and uh, it's always a pleasure to speak to knowledgeable people. So um, thank you, and I'm sure our audience enjoyed it as well. And thank you, Andrew, for uh, moderating well. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. All right. Thanks a lot.
Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Great to talk to you guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye.